look at me now, some ugly old man, but I'm very happy, happier than I've ever been, more satisfied than I've ever been. All the doubts and fears, all the de desires and longing for the wrong things, material things, stupid things, things that just belong to this life, that no matter what I collected, after 70, 80, 90 years, if I'm lucky, I would have to give them all up. I've swapped that for something permanent. I'm not going to lecture you, you know, if you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to listen. Just see what I have on my face. I'm happy. You could be happy too. This is something you should consider. I hope you will. Thank you. تعودنا في معظم حلقات هذا البرنامج أن يكون أبطال قصصنا ممن دخلوا الإسلام ببساطة وسهولة لكننا في حلقة اليوم أمام شخصية فريدة وصعبة طرحت الكثير من التساؤلات على مدى أعوام طويلة حتى وصلت إلى اليقين بالإسلام إنه سليمان أو كما كان يدعى قبل إسلامه جاري الذي جاء من بريطانيا Good evening, my name is Suleiman Busby. I've been a Muslim now for seven years, alhamdulillah. I embraced Islam here in Dubai, but after a long journey. It took me many years to uh, accept Islam. It was not an easy thing for me. As a European, uh, we're taught many incorrect things about Islam, and I had to unlearn a lot of these things. Also, alhamdulillah, I've managed to do that with the help from many good people. I came to the Middle East in 1984. I came to Bahrain um, just to work. I thought I was coming for a year. I stayed for 23 years now in the Gulf and in Turkey. I've made many friends and discovered many things. And the chief thing I've discovered is Islam. When I first came to Bahrain, I was hoping to discover the customs of the Middle East. And this has turned out to be a very difficult thing as people who come to the Gulf discover very early on. You find yourself surrounded by many foreigners of many different nationalities and faiths. They're all here to work, to achieve things for themselves. And this isn't what we expect to come for. This is not the, uh, the culture that we're expecting to find. So for some time, Islam is uh, obscured or masked from the people that come to the Gulf. So for a long time, I didn't discover anything about Islam. I heard the Adan, and I thought, this is very beautiful, what do these words mean? And people told me. But even so, this was just information. This was almost like tourism. And I'm afraid that's as far as many of us get, particularly English speakers, who find that people will speak English back to us when we arrive. And we carry on living our lives in the way we choose. And we find the other distractions and the things in the Gulf that we can do things which are not so worthy, but things which seem pleasant at the time. So I, like so many people, carried on doing this sort of thing. وبعد سنوات عشر من العمل في البحرين لم تترك أثرا كبيرا في نفسه تجاه الإسلام بدأت مرحلة أخرى من حياة سليمان. It was in fact probably 10 years later after I travelled from Bahrain to Sharjah to Dubai and then on to Turkey where I discovered something different. That's not to say that Islam is better or greater in Turkey, uh, not at all. In fact, uh, sadly, Islam is suppressed in Turkey in many ways. I discovered after my arrival in Turkey that there were some wonderful things to find out about that country. Of course, it has a, a great Islamic history, and this was sort of struck me visually straight away. I immediately discovered the beautiful Islamic architecture from the Ottoman period, the, the great mosques built by uh, Mimar Sinan. Uh, these are some of the great icons of the Islamic world and uh, of great interest to, uh, to many Westerners. And I was no exception. I was taken by the beauty of these constructions. But again, this is um, superficial Islam. And it was only after some time in Turkey I started to get to know the people very well. I made a point after my time in the Gulf of spending all my time with other foreigners. I made a point of getting to know the Turks. In fact, I made it a personal objective to try not to mix with any foreigners if I could help it, to learn Turkish and to learn the, la the culture and the customs of Turkey, which included the, the customs of Islam as it was in that country. وكان حلول شهر رمضان المبارك لأول مرة منذ وصول سليمان إلى تركيا حدثاً فتح عينيه تجاه هذا الدين 
In my first year there, uh, I, we came to Ramadan, something which I'd witnessed many times before in the Gulf, but something which I just had let it pass me by, uh, as most Westerners do. Just an annoyance, uh, an inability to get a cup of tea during the day. In Turkey, I felt something different. I felt some the sense of something else. And uh, I soon noticed that the people who were fasting in Ramadan were the people who I'd already decided that I liked. There was a, a, an obvious correlation between uh, the best of the people and the people who fasted. These proved to be the best of the Muslims, and I was attracted to them. So I joined in. I did a, what seemed like a strange thing. I started to fast in Ramadan, even though I was not a Muslim. And I found this very, uh, very pleasing in many ways, quite challenging in other ways, but, uh, but very, very pleasing. Uh, and I enjoyed the fast. I enjoyed especially the few moments before the Adan of Maghrib and uh, waiting quietly with the people that have been fasting all day, working right through the day. Uh, because in Turkey there's no allowance made for, for Ramadan in the work. So people are fasting completely from, from, uh, from the beginning of the day until dusk and they're working all the time. And I did this also. And this is difficult, but alhamdulillah we succeeded. And I was impressed with this and this gave me a feeling of achievement and it inspired me to do more studying and around this time somebody gave me my first Quran. Uh, it was a Yusuf Ali translation and I was able to read it in the English and to understand something. And I was amazed when I read it that there was nothing strange in this book. I'd expected it to be full of, I don't know, Eastern mysticism, whatever nonsense you like to think that uh, as Westerners we imagine. There was nothing odd in it. In fact, what I discovered was it wasn't like the Bible. I'd never been able to understand the Bible. The Bible seemed to me to be full of contradictions, peculiar stories that didn't seem to add up, and things which didn't seem to convey the message of Christ. Uh, the message of Jesus didn't seem to come through in the Bible except in some parts. Later I've studied this more closely and I now understand why, but that's not the subject now. The point was that the Quran made complete sense. So I read it and this inspired me to read more. I read the biography of the Rasul and uh, the life of Prophet Muhammad and this inspired me also. This was also very, very interesting. Clearly this was a great man in history. So this was facts, something that I could relate to as a Westerner interested in, in logic. And uh, I, I followed this. And I continued to follow it, but still nobody was doing any serious dawah to me. Nobody was trying to convince me that I should change my ways in any other way. So I became, if you like, uh, an abstract scholar of Islam. I could have taken a, a qualification in Islamic studies, but this is uh, of no real value if you don't intend to do something with it. And sadly, I didn't. Uh, no one drew me across it. ويرى سليمان أن المشكلة في الدعوة إلى الإسلام تكمن في أسلوب الأشخاص الذين ولدوا مسلمين بالفطرة وهذا يعني وجوب تغيير أسلوبهم في الخطاب. The example I've given uh, about this to friends over the years is that the problem uh, for a, uh, someone who may wish to embrace Islam if they are mixing with or being given dawah by born Muslims is the analogy of the man standing by the river and I'll use this story if I may, something I made up but it seems to stick in my mind and many people seem to understand it. If you're born in a country on one side of a river and that river is wide and it's fast flowing and the water is deep, maybe it's cold, you're not inclined to jump into that river and cross it no matter what the country looks like on the other side. And what I found as I studied more and more about Islam was I was looking across this river to another country metaphorical country, the, the world of Islam. And I was attracted to it, and it looked beautiful, and it looked interesting, and it seemed to be full of very nice people. But they were on the other side of this river. And when I shouted across to them, saying, how do I get there? They could only say, we don't know. We were born here. We were always here. So how can we tell you? And it went on like this. I know many people that have managed to uh, embrace Islam through the help of born Muslims. Alhamdulillah, this is wonderful, but it didn't work for me. I have got a stupid, questioning, logical uh, mind which just demands lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of answers. And if you are born Muslim, you can't answer it. So, to follow my analogy, I had to wait until I could shout across the river and say, how did you get there? And a man shouted back, oh, I crossed over a bridge, it's just down the stream. 
I can show you where it is. Follow me. And I was able to follow in the path. ورغم كل هذه الإرهاصات في تركيا، إلا أن الإسلام لم يدخل قلب سليمان حتى هذه اللحظة. ثم جاءت خطوة الانتقال إلى دولة الإمارات لتشكل مرحلة وخطوة جديدة في هذا الطريق. This is what happened to me when I came back to Dubai several years later after my time in Turkey, which had been instructive and which had led me towards Islam. But it wasn't until I came to Dubai and met suitable people that I was able to cross that bridge. After I returned from Turkey to Dubai, things had changed in Dubai as they would expect they would, and some things had changed for me. My life had changed. I was no longer married to the non-Muslim lady that I'd been married to before, and I was looking for a new start. I didn't know what sort of new start I wanted. I just thought it was something to do with work. And so I came to a, a new place to work in Dubai, but a different employer. And I was extremely fortunate at this point. Uh, by Allah, I find myself working for uh, some very excellent people. And uh, the person who was my boss became one of my great friends and still is to this day, Mr. Majid Balhasa, a great man and uh, he immediately took some interest in me. He realized that um, I was kind of lost in many ways and uh, knowledgeable in some ways but you know, foolish in others. And he had a lot of tolerance for this and a lot of humor and a lot of kindness. And he would talk a lot with me in the evening after work. We would discuss or maybe we would go out for some dinner, uh, maybe in a little bit during the office also. And he would help me to uh, study the right things and talk to the right people answer some of my questions as best he could. During this time, he actually coined a, uh, a little description for me, which was kind of uh, unkind in some way, but it stimulated me to react, uh, and I think he knew this. Uh, he called me the worst sort of kafir. Uh, now, many of you may go, oh my gosh, this is a terrible insult. Um, but he meant it kindly, and he meant it just to uh, get my interest. What he meant by this was, uh, I was not a Muslim, and yet I knew so much about Islam, and yet still hadn't embraced it. Uh, and this, of course, is, is very bad. Um, uh, we're taught that uh, if you are ignorant of Islam, and you're not brought to it, and it's not given to you in any shape or form, you're not born to it, then no harm in this. You know, you have not done anything wrong. But if you learn a lot, and you understand a lot, and you still do nothing with it, then maybe there's some doubt on you. Anyway, he didn't press me on this. He just kind of pointed it out in a nice way and allowed this to go along. But still he could see my objections were all to do with logic. All of these questions about custom and practice, all of these things that were born out of my secular upbringing. I'd never really been a Christian. I'd just been a, some sort of atheist or agnostic. I continued to ask questions, and there were questions he couldn't necessarily answer himself because, as I'd said earlier, he was that man stood on the other side of the river. He'd always been on the other side of the river. And so it wasn't easy for him to explain things to me in a way that I could understand. Fortunately, uh, at some, after some time, I think it was maybe after at least a year, uh, some men came into his orbit, some, some businessmen, some European Muslims, who were trying to uh, start a great project. Their project, particularly at that time, was the wish the, the great desire to reintroduce the Islamic gold dinar, so the currency of the Muslims. This seems like, uh, even now, seems like a, an awfully big desire and a huge goal. And it was then, it remains so. But he brought this to me and he said, hey, you're a finance man, what do you think of this? There's some European Muslims who are trying to bring uh, a practical aspect of Islam. The idea is that you cannot pay the zakah unless there is a gold dinar to pay it with. So you only have four pillars four pillars of Islam, and you must find the other one by some proper means. So he said to me, what do you think of this idea? Of course, I learned all about Islam, I knew what he meant by these pillars, and I said, rubbish, it can't be done. There's no way that they can overcome the financial system of the Kafirs, and this will fail. And he said, well, why don't you come and tell them this? Well, I think I was in a bad mood, and I said, yes, yeah, sure, I'll tell them. I'll come and meet these men. Walakin. هل التقى صاحب المزاج السيء بهؤلاء الرجال؟ And so he took us out, and I met these men. They were Spanish and Germans, spoke English very well, 
very educated, very wise, great scholars. They'd reverted to Islam 10, 20 more years before, and their knowledge was very great. Uh, these men are still doing great dawah all over the world. So we discussed. We went to this restaurant, and we talked and we talked. We started with their dinner, and I asked my questions. And for the first time, I started to get answers that I couldn't challenge. Uh, they weren't just answering my questions from a religious point of view, but they were also answering from a point of view of logic uh, and all the scientific sense that I th thought I had and I thought I had as my objections. We talked until midnight and the restaurant threw us out. <laughs> they got tired of these men sitting there debating and uh, they put us out into the street. And we talked further. Another hour we stood standing in the street in Gahud, watching the traffic go by and arguing these points of religion and philosophy. And at one o'clock in the morning, and it was, a, it was a Wednesday night in the middle of the week, they said to me, so, do you have any more questions? And I said, no, I don't. I've run out of questions. So they said, now what? You're going to embrace Islam? What could I say? I could only say yes. So it was, they uh, invited me to come to their house on the following Friday, two days later. I came to their house, we prepared, they gave me some last lessons, some last advice, things I needed to know about the Salah, uh, about making wudu, ghusl. And we went to the uh, Grand Mosque in Jumeirah, where I said my shahada. And I immediately got a, a thousand big brothers all hugging me and delighted. And I'd never seen so many happy faces, never. No birthday party, no Christian gathering, no any other sort of gathering. So many pleased people, and they were all pleased for me. Oh, I felt like the star of the show, and that was an amazing experience. The rest of that day passed in a whirl of meeting lots of new people who all treated me as something special, something I'd never been before, and this was fantastic. So I had a great day. All of that Friday from the Juma prayer onwards was a remarkable experience. I went to bed that night, I don't know, pleased but confused, I guess, and got up very early the next morning for the Fajr prayer, something I wasn't used to. And I got up every morning for the Fajr prayer thereafter, first going to the mosque that was nearby, where I'd met some people the day before, people I was comfortable with, and I spent the every Fajr prayer for the next year, more or less, uh, reading Quran in the mosque, still in English, still I had no Arabic, but uh, it was better than nothing, and it gave me something to start my day with, something to set me up, and I had all these great new friends around me, Spanish and German guys, many other reverts who were coming to a centre near there, the Jumeirah Islamic Learning Centre, which was new at that time, in the year 2000, this was seven years ago now. And I still carried on meeting great people all around the town and participating in many great gatherings. And, uh, and this increased my knowledge. وبعد هذه الرحلة الطويلة وبعد أن اعتنق الإسلام اكتشف سليمان أن أمامه تحديات لا بد من مواجهتها منها إخبار العائلة والزواج من مسلمة. One of the big challenges that came up in the days after my embracing Islam was, of course, I suddenly realized I had to tell my family. My parents, my two sisters, I have no brothers, all back in England, where I come from. And I had to explain this to them. This would be a bit of a shock. It was kind of a surprise to me, so it was bound to be a surprise to them. Uh, alhamdulillah, they weren't that surprised. And what I quickly found was is that you know, family is family. I've heard of some people have some unfortunate experiences where their families react with fear or doubt, but mine didn't. Mine accepted it. Uh, they've always been supportive. They've always said whatever is right for me, it must be right for me. And they've watched on and smiled, as they still do to this day. Still my Islam wasn't complete, and winding forward six years, it wasn't until I'd gone away from Dubai again and come back again for the third time, again, Dubai, and back to the Jumeirah Islamic Learning Center, which had moved on to another location by then, different people, new faces. But again, it was Majid Belhasa that brought me. And we came to the center, and I got to meet the people there. And the next step uh, arose. 
uh, one of the uh, ladies who run the centre said to me, Suleiman, as my name then was, I'd ceased to be Gary, I'd become Suleiman, all, my, all the friends, the good friends knew me as Suleiman, this is a name I'd chosen for myself, which is a wonderful thing, not many of us get to choose our own name, and uh, I chose mine, so I'm very happy with it. They said, Suleiman, are you married? And I thought, well, this is a bold question, but she didn't mean it like that. She just was disapproving. I said, well, no. And she said, this won't do. I said, well, you know, what to do? You know, money, have to do things. And she said, no, you have to be married. A Muslim must complete his Islam by being married. I said, well, if you say so. I don't know why I didn't argue. I should have argued, but maybe I'd learned by then not to argue with my nonsense questions. And she said, what's your specification? And we laughed. I said, I don't have a specification. She said, never mind. I think I know what it is. Anyway, the next week I came back and she stopped me and she said, Ah, Suleiman, I found your wife. I said, Really? I didn't know I'd lost her. But he said, Yes, I found her. If you come back next week, I'll introduce you to your wife. So I thought, This is interesting. Very interesting, especially as a Westerner who's unused to these sort of customs. So I came back the next week and I sat in this lady's office. She sat there with a chaperone in the proper way. And she brought this lady in, sat her down. She said, we were introduced, and we talked, and we talked, and we got on very well. And we met a few more times outside, open places where we could chat happily and uh, not be troubled by anybody, but sitting in public. And we talked and we talked, and the more we talked, the more we liked it. And after some time, my wife, who is not a revert, she's Egyptian, she's a born Muslim, said to me, well, this won't do. You can't carry on meeting like this. You know, and the coffee may be nice, but this is disgraceful. We laughed about this, but never mind. She said, so what's it going to be? I said, well, you'll have to marry me then. And uh, she said, yeah, that's okay. So we did. A few months later, I traveled to Cairo, and we married there. Alhamdulillah, I met all of her family, and it was wonderful, and they accepted me also. And this was something which I should have done long before, obviously, but everything has its time. Now my wife is my inspiration and she's completed my Islam and that enables me now to move ahead. ومن واقع تجربته الطويلة وحواراته الأطول قبل أن ينعم الله عليه بالإسلام يتوجه سليمان بكلمة إلى المسلمين وإلى من زالوا واقفين على ضفة النهر. So that's my story. I hope it doesn't bore you too much. Uh, I think I just have one thing I want to say. Those of you that are watching that were born Muslims, alhamdulillah, you were blessed. And I just hope that you treasure it and you treat it as you should, as a gift that you were given at birth, something very wonderful. If you're watching and you already are a Muslim, that you are a revert like me, then Mabruk, congratulations. Also, alhamdulillah, always alhamdulillah. I hope your story was something wonderful for you, whether it was a sudden discovery or a slow and torturous argumentative path like mine. Whatever it was, I hope it brought you to the right place. If you're not a Muslim, then I have something else to say to you. That is, look at me now, some ugly old man, but I'm very happy, happier than I've ever been, more satisfied than I've ever been. All the doubts and fears, all the de desires and longing for the wrong things, material things, stupid things, things that just belong to this life, that no matter what I collected, after 70, 80, 90 years, if I'm lucky, I would have to give them all up. I've swapped that for something permanent. I'm not going to lecture you, you know, if you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to listen. Just see what I have on my face. I'm happy. You could be happy too. This is something you should consider. I hope you will. Thank you.